So what I'll do today is I'll cover with you a number of items to do with the Army and Virtual College. First, we look at the concept. What we mean by this, what we're trying to do. And how did we implement it? What are the plans to come for the future? We'll talk about hybrid experiences. I'll define what hybrid is in a second. And then we'll talk about new expansions. It's something that we started a few years ago. We're expanding it further. And we're looking into various experiences. And for QA, what I'd like to ask you to do is to ask me questions as we move forward. Okay? So don't keep your questions till the end. If you have comments, questions, recommendations, just interrupt me. We'll take them as we move. Okay? It will make it more interesting. So we have certain needs. We have certain needs in diaspora and certain needs in the homeland. Okay? In diaspora, we do have Armenian schools in certain communities that are rich with schools. This is an Armenian school and you're, you're very lucky to have the Meridian school. You also have several other schools in, in the area, in the LA area. However, not all the Armenian communities are as lucky. Also, not every Armenian young boy or girl are lucky to come to Armenian schools. What is the percentage of Armenian kids who do not go to Armenian schools in LA? 90. 90. 90%. It's 92% according to the Yeah. So only 8% of the Armenian kids do not in LA where we have so many schools. There are many other communities where we don't have schools. New Armenian communities that are being created all over the world in East Europe, in, in Russia, in Ukraine, in uh, several other countries, including Poland, uh, Czech Republic, and how many of your schools are there? How many day schools? How many Saturday schools? Yeah. So, we have built many schools over the history, very successful schools, from India to, to, uh, to Moscow to other places, to Tbilisi. Uh, in some places, we don't have Armenians anymore to enjoy those schools. In other places, we do have Armenians, but the schools are not operational. So, physical schools have their problems with it. So wherever we can have physical schools and we can enjoy their presence and benefit from them, that's great. But in certain places that is not possible. So what we have to do is we have to find an alternate solution. And for us the alternate solution was online school, e-learning. And e-learning is not something new. It has been there for some time and it is developing further. So we can benefit from that. Now, in diaspora, the number of Armenian students that have no opportunity to go to Armenian physical schools, that percentage is very low. Almost 98% of Armenian kids don't have opportunity to go to Armenian schools in that at large. Uh, homeland also has problems sometimes or can benefit from online learning or e-learning. Why? Because the, the, the classical schools uh, are not perfectly equipped to teach all new topics these days. There are many new topics that are taught through the internet, through online learning. And we can, we can do that in Armenia as well. So the, the virtual college happens to be not only the first Armenian institution to teach, uh, to give Armenian education in diaspora, but also it is the first for Armenia. So both in diaspora and in Armenia, we can, we can learn from the experience and we can see what we can do with it. So what is, Armenian, uh, what is online education, first of all? Uh, it is typically an internet-based courses, some of which are recorded courses, where a professor is teaching and he's recorded, explaining, and you, you see him acting as if he is in the classroom. No, we didn't do that. What we chose is the second alternative. And the second alternative is multimedia courses. And multimedia courses being uh, Video, audio, pictures, and text all mixed together nicely to give you the maximum possibility with graphics, with, uh, with uh, text content, as well as with audio content that we mix them together to provide the, the, the most. Okay. So multimedia courses are this continuity of elements together. So we built syllabus. We built the, the, the lecturing aspect of it through multimedia. But as you know, in schools, you don't only go to the lectures and listen to the lessons. 
okay? You also have the second piece of experience, which is interacting between teacher and student, between the students themselves. Okay? So online learning has to mimic the school experience. Therefore, what we have is what we will, based on the recommendations in e-learning, we have a system that has 50-50, that is 50% you follow the lectures and 50% the interaction, the experience of interacting with others, discussing the topics with others, and so on. For which, besides the lectures which are in multimedia, we do have discussion forums. We are all part of discussion forums, perhaps on the internet, where you participate in discussions. So this is, every classroom has a virtual discussion forum, where all the students discuss with each other and with the, with the professor, with the teacher, uh, in a forum. There's, of course, emailing being used. Uh, there are office hours where we have chat established in the office hours between the teachers, the online instructor, and individual students. And there are many other ways of communication that are good. Typically, every student during the class period, every week has a scheduled time with the online instructor via Skype communication, one-on-one. -on -one. Also, we have group activities where the students among each other also they have uh, Skype calls where they do discussions, where they practice what they learn in language and so on. So, we try to utilize various means of communication to build the school, whether it's textual, it's audio, or video communication. Uh, those courses do come also, like any other courses, with uh, homeworks, with midterms, with finals, with projects, but they are all delivered online, corrected, and, and, and received online, and so on. So it is nice to see those, those uh, activities being built around the course. Plus, there are lots of, to make it easier, uh, lots of games, puzzles, uh, other games, crosswords, and so on being built to make it more appealing. It is different. It's different to sit by yourself on a computer and do your own study where you don't have physically a private classroom around you. You don't have a professor facing you. So, if things are virtual, you need to make it more interesting, more appealing for the student to do the job. That's why having the games, having the communications, and so on, are there to ensure that that attachment is built. Okay? Because this peer pressure with students around you is, is not there. There's a peer pressure from a virtual classroom, and you have your virtual classmates with whom you communicate. You're taking a course, you have a, a, another uh, student, virtual students uh, that was sitting in, in Sydney, one sitting in South America, one sitting in, in Toronto. And these are the classmates, you're interacting with them. Therefore, you build relations. Like any other physical classroom, you build relations. In this case, it is an international base of relations that you're building. Which is very good, because typically these are diaspora Armenians who are sitting far away from each other, but they have the same goal of having Armenian education, learning Armenian topics together. So, creating other, other components, the courses go with, with, with numerous sets of activities, long lessons. Now, what do we teach? What is our education? Our education, the way we understand it, has at least three major departments, three major topic areas. Okay. One is language, that is, learning our language. And as you know, our language has two branches. That is the Eastern Armenian and the Western Armenian. And we do have Kiyantian for both. Therefore, we have two separate programs, one teaching Eastern Armenian and one teaching Western Armenian. They have equivalent levels both. And we teach the same amount of vocabulary, the same amount of conversation, and so on, at each level. Now, the difference from what we typically do here at Merdinian or other schools, we teach Armenian as a second language. So it's not the first language as the kid is coming to the school. But rather, you assume that that person already knows a language, therefore is learning a second language now. So second language teaching has its own principles, has its own levels, has its own structure. And we, we follow standard international ways of distribution of courses. Typically there are nine levels, starting from the beginner's level, building up to the, uh, to the ninth level. By completing those nine levels of courses, a student will be able to do full verbal communication, that is understanding and speaking, comprehension and speaking, uh, 
uh, writing and reading. So it gives the complete uh, capability of the person. Now, to do that, we have to start from ground zero by allowing the person not only to just read the alphabet, but rather to communicate. So from the first course to the second to the third, communication starts early on. That's why the student with the online instructor, uh, with the fellow other classmates, virtual classmates, they start this communication, the conversation, at the very early stage, which is, which is appealing. Some students come to us and say, we only want to learn speaking. We don't want to learn reading and writing. But to make it complete, we do have the full, full set. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, you said that you're teaching Armenian as a second language. That's correct. Second that means language. there's a core language that, that, that goes with it, sort of, maybe with some explanations and stuff. Is that correct? Is that English? Or? That, that, that is English. That is okay. one option. So what we did, and I'll come back to that point soon, but I can start with it. Uh, we, we looked at the diaspora, and we looked at what are the languages that are mostly covered in diaspora. Of course, English is, is one of the main ones, that you could have English as your first language. And through English, you learn Armenian. Therefore, the explanations and so on are all in English. Uh, also, when you speak with your online instructor, the online instructor needs to know English emails and exchanges with discussion forums with your fellow students are in English. So for every course you have the English based teaching of Armenian, whether it's Eastern or Western. But English is not the only language, we look at other languages as well. But for us living in the United States, yes, English is, is one and today is the most popular uh, way to start. Uh, besides language, the second topic that is important and we see need for it is history. There are many people who may or may not know the language but they'd like to know about the history. And this is not a history that is the way it is taught to the, to the children, but rather it's a more mature way of teaching history. It is history, history of Armenians, not only Armenia, but Armenians that is the diaspora in England, the old diaspora, the new diaspora. But also it is very uh, comprehensive in the sense that it is comparative history. While we were doing something, or while the Armenians were doing something, what others were doing around them, what the neighboring countries were doing, and otherwise. So it is nice to see the, 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 the comparative aspect of it, to put it into perspective of what the Armenians were doing at different era. And the way we cover it is we look at it through historic periods. The, the first Armenian history course starts from the, the ancient ages, the creation of Armenia as a highland. We start from there and go forward. And then we go, of course, to the Middle Ages and it goes up to today. So we have eight levels of Armenian history. Each Armenian history course would, would cover its, its certain period and it's continued. Um, if you look at the totality, you cover the entirety. But of course, a student is allowed to, to take any one of those courses and in any order. So it's not mandatory to take it from the beginning to the end. Uh, it's quite an open system, so a student can choose any one of those. In case you're interested only in the Middle Ages, you would, you would be able to do that. Or some are interested only in the period, the seventh course, which is the period of, of uh, the Armenian Genocide, the, the late 18th century, beginning of 19th century, with the communist government in Armenia. So that period is quite popular as well. That is level seven. Then after that is the contemporary Armenian history. So, Learning history typically is with lots of maps, lots of dynamic activities, uh, <clears throat> tables, comparisons, and so on. So it is, it's, a, it's a way of making it pleasant to the student while sitting in front of the computer, using all the multimedia options, all the colors and, and motion to, to, to learn history. The third department that we have is the culture department. And as you know, our culture is rich, so we can have different topics in the first topic that we started with was Armenian architecture. And uh, the Armenian architecture course, two courses actually back to back, uh, covered the, dif the different periods of our Armenian architecture, from all the ages up to the modern architecture today of Armenia and Armenian uh, entities outside Armenia, covering diaspora, uh, institutions, and the architectures used. Similarly, music, we do have two courses of Armenian music, again, quite rich. Contents, samples of music 
whether it's audio or video. Uh, visual art, visual art being things like the, the, the khashkars, the rugs, the manuscripts, and so on. So all, all of those together make two nice courses of visual art, ending with photography and so on. So we have, we have again a lot, lots of richness in, in, in those periods. So we cover the, 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 the culture there. So this is the main, the main activities that we have uh, in terms of courses. When we started the Army Amateur College, we didn't have all of this available to us yet. So when we did the feasibility study, uh, initially, we showed the results of the feasibility study back in 2006, several years ago, seven years ago, um, at the HBU General Assembly in Cairo at that time, it was the 100th anniversary. And there was a workshop on education, a one-day workshop. So we presented the feasibility study there, and that's where uh, the HBU Central Board wanted to adopt this project, seeing the, the, the prospects, seeing the potential of it. And uh, we gladly uh, went to that path, and we were very successful. And today the project is uh, fully sponsored by the Central Board of HBU as an alternate way of education, providing uh, Armenian education via the internet, via the, the online access. Uh, <coughs> So 2006 was the feasibility, but 2009 was the first time that we opened the school to the public because we had the first layer of courses ready, the first language course, the first history course, the first culture course ready for it to be, to be offered to the public. And we started building since then, uh, layer by layer, the rest of it. Today we do have our nine Armenian language courses already completed, the history courses completed, in the language, actually, we are in, on version 2.4. We are, we are renewing the, the total content, uh, modernizing it further. Uh, music, architecture are also there. With the culture, we are ready to, to add newer layers soon. So we'll be adding uh, literature, we'll be adding anthropology. We have a, a, a number of, of other Armenian topics to cover under the department. And over time, we are expanding as we move forward. Question. Do you target a specific age of a student? Very good point. Um, we do. We do. Uh, age wise. So if you think of. Especially for the language. Yeah. Individuals who want to learn. So, so, the, so that is the, the, the language or, or history, you can think of it uh, from a topic. But besides the topic, online learning is a commitment. Online learning needs self motivation. Yeah. You don't have a teacher to teach you. So that's why we, from the beginning, we said we don't want to, to do it for the kids yet. Okay? But because to do it for the kids, to motivate the kids, you need a lot more, you need lots of more games, lots of more animation, and so on, to compete with their other games. Uh, instead, you need somebody who's mature enough to be self motivated, mature enough to, to be willing to go sit in front of the computer and spend four to six hours per week. To learn, right? and that's why I said it has to be high school age and above. Okay? So what we say is 16 and above, we could be an individual student. So an individual student, we have rare cases of, of kids who are 12, 13 years old, who, who are very willing to learn, we accept them after a certain test. Or else you disturb the, the classroom, if you are not committed as the others to, to, to go through this process. So 16 and above are mature enough to be self-motivated to sit there and, and, and commit their time and be willing to, to do it because they control their own time, their, their, their own motivation to do the job. Now, kids below 16, we have approached them as well. Actually, they have approached us and we do have a different program for groups. So we have groups of school kids, not as individual students. So the individual students is 16 and above, but for, for groups, that is classrooms at various schools, Using the Army Amateur College, we have done that for younger ages. And I'll come back to that in a second. So typically we say it is 16 to any number. And I'll show you some statistics of where are the, the actual numbers, how, what is the demographics, the distribution among our students today. So back to the topic of languages. So we said that English is one language to start with for a different topic. But as you know, we have a very large community in, in Russia, or in Ukraine, where the Russian can be the, the first language to teach language. But also when you teach history, when you teach culture, you need to teach again in a given language. So the Russian is there. 
French is another. French is quite popular as well. So we have a, a large diaspora that speaks French, Spanish, especially for South America, and now the new communities in, in Spain, Barcelona and Spain. Uh, and finally, Turkish. Uh, we do have Armenians. Why the origins of Armenians may not know Armenian at all today, who know Turkish today, not other languages. And therefore, we have to reach them as well. So we, there was a demand for that, and we have developed uh, the courses based on Turkish. Plus, we have our two Armenians, Western and Eastern. So when we teach history or when we teach cultural courses, we have to teach them also in Armenian. Because we do have certain clientele who speak Western or Eastern Armenian and do that. So, the totality is seven languages. So, today every course in history comes in seven languages. Every course in architecture comes in seven languages. And you have a teacher of that language, a classroom of that language, all the communication, the forums, the projects, the funding, everything goes on in that language. That's it. Architecture number two in Spanish. The whole class will be studying architecture, second level, in Spanish with the teacher and so on. So it's, it's wide. It's quite rich as a program. But in order to reach our diaspora, we cannot do it differently. So we have to, to open it up. You have a comment? Yeah, it's, it's, it could be an over, overwhelming task. I mean, it is overwhelming. If you, have, you look at the number of courses, imagine eight courses in history in seven languages. So you have 56 courses just built in the history domain and you keep updating and upgrading and modifying. Same thing in architecture, same thing in music, same thing in languages, and, and both branches of languages. And the teacher is assigned to each one of those courses. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you have yes. a schedule. You follow a schedule. Right? You have a list of courses, but you offer certain courses in the period. Yes. So we do, yeah, let me give you an idea about the schedules as well. Um, so we do, we go with a quarterly based schedule. So we have spring quarter, summer quarter, fall quarter, winter. Out of these three months, our, our lessons cover nine weeks of, of three months. Okay? So nine weeks of 12 weeks is when you have a course. And then you have three weeks break for the students. And then nine weeks again, three weeks break. Of course, not every student needs to come at every quarter again. They can take a quarter break, two quarters break, then come back. So the system is flexible. But it is nine out of twelve. And it is nine, the first week is an orientation week. Orientation week in the sense that they have to be trained, they have to be prepared. There are certain exercises, uh, tools, and so on to be, to be prepared for. So they start with the teacher the first week, but it's an orientation week. It doesn't cover the topic, it covers the preparation of online learning. Uh, eight weeks are core uh, lessons. So each week of, out of those eight, you have one lesson opening up. So every Monday a new lesson opens. Now you're responsible for that lesson. The first two, three days you have to go through the lesson yourself. In the middle of the week you have a scheduled office hour with your teacher. The second half of the week you communicate with the, your classmates, your virtual classmates, about that through the forums. At the end of the week you send your homework, you're ready for the next one. So it, it is built on a weekly basis. And it is very synchronous in that sense. Where you are free to study at any time you want, any hour of the day you want, because you're in different time zones and so on. But in, in terms of weekly process, you go hand in hand with the rest of your classroom. That way you have classmates, that you have, you have a, a group, that, that all of them are studying together, and you develop relations, ties, you join projects, and so on. Now, back to your question of, do we offer certain courses in certain terms and not others? Until now, the demand was high enough to give all the courses at every term. Okay. So we are opening all the courses for every term. Now, some courses have max numbers, and the max is 15 students per course. More than 15 is not allowed in online learning, because then you lose the, 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 the time. Uh, other courses may have four or five students, which is still okay. We may open them as well. Certain topics, um, studying, uh, fifth level Armenian, in Turkish, uh, may have less a number of students, which is fine. We still are going with it. Eventually, we may be scheduling it differently. Certain courses in certain term, quarters, but not others. I was thinking, is it the summer a higher enrollment? Summer is higher enrollment, I think, yes. We see 
You see many people starting in the summer, they continue later in the fall and winter, but usually benefiting from the summer term. If they are the, the kids in university age. But we have many people who are post-university, adults, like all of us, willing to learn. And uh, we, we cover that, that several age groups. And there, the summer or not summer doesn't matter. So, yes? I, I'm amazed. Actually. So right now you have enough demand to offer Say one, you know, the the history series. Over oh, than fifty courses. Yes. Yes. Every fifty, every, every twelve, course, yes. every course, Correct. every twelve weeks. Okay. Yes. So enough demand means that each class has at least how many students? The minimum is five people. In the okay. So you have at least five people. Five up to between 50. five and up to fifty. Between five. And 50. Yes. Wow. It is. <laughs> It's nice and they experience this experience. I, mean, I, I myself I entered two courses and just reading the discussion forums, the discussions going on between the students, it's, it's so exciting. And the most exciting part is at the beginning when students, when they apply, so it's application, so you don't get automatically. So you, you apply and then you get accepted. But in the application, you have to, to write about your motivation. Just reading the motivations of the students who are coming, it's, 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 it's very impressive. And when we started and until now, most of the people who are in the course are, are really impressive to have. Most of them have very deep education, lots of interest coming from roots or coming from uh, interest of, of various places. So, so uh, just looking at the background of the individuals who are committing themselves, it's really impressive. So people with good motivations, strong backgrounds, being able to, to come in and, and, uh, and provide uh, lots of uh, So this variety of languages gave us a good strength and gave us the ability to penetrate in different regions. Uh, even though we are not covering all the languages of diaspora, still we have demands. Today I have an email from, from Germany, why don't we have the courses in Germany? Somebody from Ukraine, why don't we have it in Ukraine? But we have it in Russia, it should not be too far, but it is. It's more convenient if you have it also in Ukraine. So we, we do have demand in, in Polish, why don't we have it in Polish? Why don't we have it in Arabic? Persia. So there is demand to expand it further. Uh, so it's a project that's expandable if we wanted to. But at this, at this point, we're trying to put our arms around it and at least do our best in, in the seven languages that we have mm -hmm. today. The instructors are uh, and traditional schools, and they do this uh, in addition to the uh, yeah, They are not. They are not instructors in traditional schools because the f they, are, they need a couple of things. Uh, we prepared a six months preparation for, a, for an online instructor. Uh, the first condition is to know one of those seven languages because they'll be communicating in Spanish, in Russian. So they have to have good skills of, of language skills. Second is they have to be uh, technically very savvy. So you cannot take individuals who are not technically too savvy because the students who they are communicating, whoever is doing online learning and so on, typically they are quite savvy. So you need to reciprocate that with your teachers as well. Uh, topical content, content knowledge. Okay, you have to know history, you have to know culture, you have to know language, and we prepare them there as well to, to, to bring them up to, up to speed. Okay. So online learning has its own rules, its own uh, pedagogy. So prepare them for online pedagogy. Uh, so that, that's what we do. Uh, now, well, those online instructors are typically in, in Armenia. We have some that are in the U.S., some that are elsewhere, but the majority are in Armenia. That's where we prepared the first team, some of which are outside. We have one in L.A., we have one in Louisiana, and so on. So we have a, a wider range now to cover time zones, yes. yes. Because being in Yerevan is very good, but uh, since you have students from all over the world, you have to cover a wide range of time zones. So it's, 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 it's not an easy burden on the instructor to be able to do office hours at multiple time zones, run exams uh, or, or group discussions in multiple time zones. You have a question? Yeah. Are you going to talk about the uh, credit hours, low ones? Yes, yeah. I can do that. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so uh, content-wise, what we're looking at is we'll be looking at the content that is uh, developed uh, by experts. 
So whether it's language or it's history or it's so topically. So topically you need the experts. And we're using Armenia as a source for that. So the language is coming from the, the Elvan State University, the history is coming from the, 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 the history institution in the Academy of Sciences, the music is coming from the, uh, the music school, Comida uh, School of Music. So, so the, the experts are coming from there. Plus we have reviewers from diaspora for every topic. So uh, academics in diaspora who are experts in this, because you, you want to keep the balance as well. You don't want to put it only centered on, on, on Armenia, but make it Armenian at large. So that's why we have uh, we have a very good set of experts who prepare the content. Now that content is one piece. It has to be enriched with a number of things. The course is being multimedia. You cannot only rely on the text that is prepared. You need to have with it a um, huge amount of photos and videos and audio content to, to complement, to make it multimedia. So the base comes from the expert professors. Around it, we build this, this additional layer. And then when we offer it, we offer it in textual form, in video form, but also in a nice audio form. So what you need, you need a narration to go with it. So the main text gets translated to those seven languages. So we have a layer of translation. A layer of editing, so after each translation, editors need to optimize it further. And these have to be, the translators typically are in Armenia. The editors are typically people who have that language as their first language. Like Spanish or Uruguay, France, the French would be in France and so on. And then the narrators. And narrators are also people who have the language as an authentic language for themselves. That's their first language. And uh, we choose them based on voice capabilities and so on. So we choose the, the right narrators uh, with the right uh, accent, the right tonality. Uh, and we do the narration, we record it in different countries, depending on where the person is. You know, right? The Spanish is done in South America, as I was saying. The Russian is done in Armenia. Uh, so the narration makes it more appealing, because in these courses you can read it, you can not really just listen to it. You can look at the dynamic maps while listening to the, to the text. So you have multiple ways of looking at it. Apparently, each one of us has different ways of learning. Uh, some of us learn better by listening, others by reading, others by watching. Okay? So there's a test actually. We have a test online in the Armenian Virtual College where you can test yourself to see which category you belong to. I know myself, I, I learn better by listening. So if there's a lecture, the slides, I, I, I follow the audio rather than the, 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 the pictures. So there are different people who have different ways. Some who, who prefer to read the text directly. So once you find out which, which, where is your strength, you can switch it to that mode. You can switch it to text mode, to audio mode, to video mode, and, and, and work. So we try to accommodate those as well. Uh, we were lucky to have a good pool of, of professors in, in online pedagogy who have helped us in, in Berkeley, in Stanford, and also in Turin. Okay, so we had three professors, non-Armenian, who were very, uh, very instrumental in helping us uh, develop the, the pedagogical aspects of this. Now, back to the, to the actual students and where they come from. So as we said, we're looking for uh, mature students, not, not the children, as individual students. And we have students from high school age, university age, and the general public, the adults in general public who are doing it for continuing education. And if you look at it, some of them would be interested in getting credit for it. Others would be just auditors. They would not be willing to get credit. Just observe the course, be auditor in it, and don't participate in the uh, midterms and uh, finals, but rather do it out of interest without the need for, for the credit. So we have both branches. So we have some like this, some like that. I'll show you some statistics in a moment. Uh, Credit-wise, every course you do, you have a credit. You have a credit in the school, and those credits are transferable. If you are, you belong to a certain institute, you want to transfer it, you would be able to transfer it. Plus, if you do a track, so we do have uh, a certificate for a person who finishes the track. That is the history track, or the language track, or the culture track. So that is, the virtual college provides its own certificates for that. Uh, entirety, we did not have a degree until very recently.
Just last month, the Ministry of Education in Armenia uh, allowed us to provide a master's degree. So now we are a graduate school. We can give MA degree for uh, so we do have the requirements for that. But officially now we, we don't only give certificates for language or history and so on, but also the collection of this with a research component, with a research project uh, allows one to have a master's degree. So it's a very nice addition. Yes. Student here, high school student, right? Yes. They have if you take a foreign language course as an elective, right? Yes. They be able to take this as a substitute and get credit They will be able to do that. Now, what, what they need to do though is they need to, to, to do the transfer. So we provide necessary uh, documentation for them to transfer, but they have to negotiate with, with their own professor, with their own school for it to be made. Uh, each one of those are considered university level courses, they are certified as university level courses. Okay, so besides doing these individual students for which we created, yes? A very good question. Go ahead. No is, is there a fee for these classes? For there's a fee. Uh, there's a fee. We, we thought about it from the beginning. Uh, if we don't put any fee, anything free has no value. Right. Right. So we had to put a value on it, and we do have a value. So each, each course has a fee. It's 199 It's 199 uh, for one course. Okay. Uh, we do have many students who cannot pay the fee. Therefore, we do have a scholarship mechanism. They receive uh, full scholarship, halfway, quarter, and so on. So on. And we have a large number of people coming from certain countries where they cannot afford, of course, they get it free of charge. Uh, for Georgia, it's totally free of charge. But for certain other countries as well. So we have established uh, that. We establish also groups. So there are some organizations that uh, the Peace Corps, okay, in Armenia. Uh, whoever goes with the Peace Corps, we give them a certain fixed discount automatically, and so on. So uh, the idea is not to make money out of this. Uh, AGBU was very, very generous in adopting this solution. Uh, but uh, in order to put the value on it, uh, we need to connect it with some fee. It's a symbolic fee. Uh, the fees that we collect uh, don't cover, they are less than 5% of our cost. So they don't cover the cost. There's a good amount of, of effort that goes on. We do have uh, a number of full-time employees, a number of part-time employees who sit behind this, in addition to a large number of volunteers who many, many hours with their expertise in various aspects, technology domain, pedagogy domain, and content. Uh, <clears throat> so to answer the question, yes, there is a fee associated with it. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. If one will, will need to pay a reduced fee, there is a form to fill and to show how much your income is accordingly, you get your discounts. Uh, so besides this individual student aspect for which we created this, uh, we noticed soon after, the year after, they started to approach us for existing schools. So some Saturday schools and so on start to say that we need to have to use the Armenian Virtual College part of the classroom, part of the, the teaching uh, mechanism by having an on-site instructor, but instead of using a book, using this multimedia mechanism to and today we do have a, a number of those. We do have um, up to 10 schools. We don't want to increase it too fast in order to contain it. But we have 10 schools around the world who are using the Army Virtual College courses in their curriculum. Um, the first was the Bohanesian School in Sharjah, near Dubai. Uh, we have an Armenian church in Sharjah. Uh, the church uh, works on Fridays because Friday is the official uh, holiday day. In uh, and the school uh, operates on Fridays. So the kids were, were going to school up to the sixth grade, and after that, uh, the kids were not continuing in this in this one. This young school, which is a very good school, built next to the church. Uh, so we were requested to give a course for students of seventh and eighth grade, and we did that through our history courses. So we provided history courses for those students, and they stayed longer, and they did the, the, they came every Friday to do the history course as a group with each other, and then at the end get, get our certificate and so on. That, that continues, we now customize a special course for them, a collection of history topics uh, that fits their, their academic year, and they, they use that with the on-site instructor, and they communicate with the online instructor in Armenia, and they do their homeworks online, of course, and so on. So on. 
so that was uh, one example. We moved on with others. Uh, now we have our school in Detroit that uses it for language teaching. Uh, the school in Detroit has about 50% Armenians and 50% non-Armenians, all of which use the, the, the same courses, multiple levels. Uh, we do have our Kanuga Park School here, uh, the HBU School, Manuka Demitra, who uses the music courses, the architecture courses, the most sophisticated courses in the, in the higher school. Uh, in Buenos Aires, we do uh, use the language courses in Montevideo as well. In Sao Paulo, again, the Turian School uses uh, the language courses using Spanish to teach uh, Armenian. And we, we started to see Armenian Virtual College labs being re uh, instated or established in certain places. In, in Rostov, Russia, where I will have the opportunity to be in two weeks' time, we have established a lab, uh, an army virtual college lab, where uh, the kids as well as the senior uh, adults would sit together and learn it as a group. And also in Tbilisi, next to the church, as in a cultural center, where we do have also an Armenian uh, virtual college lab, an ABC lab, with computers, with projection, with an on site teacher. So they learn together Armenian language in Tbilisi. As you know, you have uh, a need for, for uh, Armenian language learning in, in Georgia. The regular schools that taught Armenian are, are getting uh, reduced year after year. So having additional layer of, of teaching via ABCs is very important for the community. Uh, as I mentioned, Oanesian school in Sharjah was the first to start. We already had this for three years. This is a classroom where the, the kids are learning history um, at the, the Sharjah school. This is the age of 7th, 8th grade where, where they come in and do their, their lessons. Do you uh, first as a group and then, then individually they do their homeworks. Yes? Do you provide the computers and the equipment? No, they have their own laptops. They, they bring their, their, their equipment. We provide the course, uh, the subscription to the course, the support by online instructors. And we train the on-site instructors. <clears throat> He's very happy. <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, this is in Buenos Aires. This is our school in Buenos Aires. Where, but you see, the good thing is that if students are at different levels, they can do different level of courses, even though they're sitting in the same classroom. Okay? The teacher goes, one of them can be at level two, the next student can be at level three, so they can excel, they can do faster, and they, we can adapt to that. So this kind of mechanisms allow you to have multiple levels in the same classroom. Yes? I thought it was very structured, 12-week kind of session. For individual students. For this type, we call this hybrid. Hybrid because it is online and physical combined together. And schools have their own academic year. In South America, the academic year is very different than North America. Uh, so, uh, and they have different number of hours per week for each course. So we adjust ourselves to it. So we do customize. Uh, so each school has it, it's, it's, its own way of doing it. So as I was mentioning for Sharjah, we created courses to fit their, their weeks in the year. Same thing here, we can, we can do different ways. Of it. But we're not looking at those schools as isolated entities. Because we have this online manner to communicate, uh, we are creating links between the schools. So we have activities, competitions, uh, collaborations between schools. The school in Detroit with the one in Los Angeles, the one in Buenos Aires with the one in Detroit, and so on and so forth. The one in Rostov and the one in Tbilisi. Uh, if the time zones don't conflict with each other, we create a nice set of activities between the schools. So the students develop relations with other Armenian kids of their age somewhere else in the world, which, which is also a value. So more of uh, the activities, this is again Buenos Aires for their, their visit. So to look at some statistics uh, of where we are today. So today if I look at the students who are doing hybrid schooling, meaning via classrooms, versus the individual students, it's about one third, two thirds. So two thirds are individual students, and one third is, is the ones that are doing it via the classrooms. If I look at the auditors versus the ones who are doing it for credit, surprisingly, the auditors are smaller percentage 
versus the ones who would like to have a credit. And some of the ones who are auditing, they like to take the, the exams to test themselves to see how well they are. It's interesting. It's not for the credit, but just to, to find out how well they are. Question? To grade themselves. Yes, to grade themselves, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> the ages. So the age distribution is interesting. You see, uh, below 20 years old is this orange area. So we have 32%, about one third of the students are below 20 years old, which comes naturally. Then 20 to 30 is the next group, 26%. And 30 to 40 is 18%. And it starts to go down okay, to uh, up to this, 50 to 60, 61 to 70. And we have 4% of the students are above 70. Uh, the oldest young student that we have is 88, who is very, very active, very good grades. Uh, <clears throat> we spoke about grades also. So at the end of the course, then we have grading system. And with the grading system, we, we especially look at the ones who have good grades who get A's. And whoever gets an A automatically gets a free next course. Okay. So it's a, good incentive. it's a very good incentive. And many of them are very, very competitive to get an A. To just to, to, the idea is that to, to, to have the next course free of charge and, and move ahead. And some of them pay only the, for the first course and then continue for all the rest free of charge because they, they are able to get the A's back. <clears throat> now, country wise, uh, the largest percentage of students, as you would assume, comes from the US because we have more uh, penetration in the community here uh, to talk about this. We have 21% of our students from the United States. We have 16% uh, in Brazil. We, we do quite well in Brazil. The media there covers us. Uh, interviews on radios, on TVs in Brazil. It, they're, they're really very, uh, they, they like this a lot. Most Even though we don't have it in Portuguese, we do it in Spanish. But still, it's, it's quite popular. Mostly Sao Paulo? Mostly Sao Paulo, yes, yes, but the other cities also do that. But uh, the, the community majority is in Sao Paulo. You have smaller presence in Rio and in, in Brazil. Uh, Argentina, 12%. So Argentina also is, is quite active in, both in, in, uh, in Buenos Aires and Cordoba. Uh, Georgia, 11%. We did a, a, a nice campaign in, in TBDC. These are mostly from TBDC, lesser from Qatar, uh, from the Java region. So we, we have uh, good penetration, and not only kids. So we have school, school age, also we have many adults. So adults also can come to the ABC lab and will learn it. Russia, 7%. The diaspora, the community in Russia is, is larger than the US. But 7% uh, is, is, is very good. So we have been trying to penetrate there more. Uh, we have been in Moscow, we have been in St. Petersburg, uh, in Rostov, uh, we'll be visiting them again very soon uh, to cover them again. So hopefully we can enter it more. France is 5%, uh, Armenia proper is 4%, and some of them are Armenians, some of them non Armenians who are living in Armenia, who would like to, whether they're from embassies, from um, NGOs, organizations, or people who are there for, for their own business. Uh, Uruguay, Syria, Canada, United Arab Emirates, and so on. So, forth. so we have 61 countries where our students are distributed. And some countries where we don't have strong uh, presence as, as Armenian communities within. At least our channels of, of informing using the HBU magazines, uh, the, the distribution list, and so on. Uh, places like China. We do have students from, from Shanghai. We do have students in Japan, we do have students in Venezuela, in Kazakhstan, in, in Lithuania. So places where we don't think of easily because we, we don't have direct links, but internet is internet. It reaches everywhere and they find you. Uh, they find you via Google, they find you via various other ways and, and, and subscribe. You have a long list of, of individuals who would like to be students eventually, but they are not registered for courses yet. And that, that covers a wider range of countries. Almost every country in the world will have people who are registered. That is, any one of you will be able to go and create a login, a username and password, and be able to access the, uh, the campus 
and see sample courses and so on before becoming a student. 182 countries where we have individuals who have been, who are registered as, as members of the BC. Can you? Yes. Can you give us an idea of what percentage of the Armenian learners, language learners, want to learn Eastern Armenian versus Western Armenian? Very soon. I'm coming there in two slides. Uh, so, I don't remember the number, that's why I'm not mentioning the number. <laughs> let's, let's see on the slides. Um, the motivation. Why do people come and take courses? So we always ask about motivation and classify them. So about half of them are because they have Armenian origins. So the reason for them is their origin being Armenian. But the rest are not. The rest are, 22% are interested in the Armenian culture. So they may be Armenians or not, but not because of their origin, but because of the, the cultural ties. 9% because of Armenian spouses. These are the non-Armenians who are either married or engaged or friends of, would like to impress the parents or so a number of interesting reasons. Um, we had a case in the first quarter when we opened, a lady uh, that applied. She said, I am Mimi from Shanghai. I'm not Chinese, I'm Japanese. I live in Shanghai, but I want to learn the Armenian language. And the reason to learn the Armenian language is that her husband, Armen, was teaching, there, was talking to the three kids in Armenia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it was, it was interesting for her to learn language as well, to be part of the family discussions. Uh, so we have various spouses like that, and that number is, keeps increasing. I know that uh, we have lots of mixed marriages, and this is a way of, of, of turning that mixed marriage to an Armenian marriage. Uh, <clears throat> we have academics who are non armenians who would like to learn somebody from the University in Sao Paulo who would like to learn Armenian music, and, and so on. So we have people who, are, who have a period of And we have 4% of our students who are there because of business reasons, because of travel reasons. Uh, because they are doing business in Armenia or because they have to visit Armenia, therefore they have to prepare themselves. Okay. So it's a variety of reasons for, for the motivation itself. For the instruction languages, we said we have seven languages for instruction. Uh, the, the largest number is, is English. So the largest number of, of, of students learn from English, Armenian, or Armenian history, or Armenian uh, The second is uh, obviously Russian. So 20% of the, the students are coming from the Russian the Students in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Russia, they're coming from that and then Even students all around the world who, who know better Russian than English, they will learn it via Russian. Uh, we do have French, about 7%. 24% Spanish. You saw the numbers in Brazil, in Argentina, and so on. So 24% of, of our students do, do, do it via uh, Spanish. And Western and Eastern Armenian are smaller percentages because this assumes that you already know the language, you're learning history or culture. These are not the language courses. Now, if I look at the, what courses are more popular today, uh, the language courses are the most popular. So, 71% of the students are doing Armenian language courses. Okay? So, less than 30% are doing history, architecture, music. And in there, if I look at the division between Eastern and Western, you see that the Western is slightly bigger than Eastern Armenia today, in terms of demand. And that's not uh, perhaps the demographics of the diaspora today. Perhaps the demographics of the diaspora is 50-50 today. But the students that we are reaching are more the, the ones who are willing to, to, to learn Western Armenian versus Eastern. Yes? So if... Uh... <coughs> If a student doesn't have a preference, yes, versus Eastern or Western Armenian, does HBU suggest one more than the other? Uh, we ask questions. We ask questions. Some of them come and they ask for a recommendation. We say we want to learn Armenian. That's you have these two. Which one I think? Yeah. Okay. So we ask questions. Why are we? Why are we learning? Is it to communicate with your parents, with your grandparents, or it is to, to visit Armenia? Or it is so, so once you understand why they want to learn, then it's easy to recommend one of them. 
So if it is to visit Armenia, of course, Eastern Armenia will be more meaningful for them to learn. If it is to, to, to communicate with their family, which happens to be a Western Armenian, or, or, or otherwise, or her husband, okay? So where is your husband from? He's from Beirut, okay? Then you have to understand. So we, 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 we dig a little bit to find out what to really is. Also possible. Also possible. But usually, you, you don't particularly uh, promote one versus the other. We don't particularly. No, no. We, we look at serving them the best. So if they need one versus the other, we, we try to serve them the most. Somebody wants to do business with Armenia, so you don't teach in Western Armenia. So we so look at the reason and accordingly make the recommendation. Yes. So for Eastern Armenia, use the spelling that's now used in Armenia. That's correct. That's correct. Because they wanted to visit Armenia. They have to some documents. Absolutely. Test to be practical. Yes? I was wondering why Arabic is not We looked at it as well because we have a large community in Arabic. First of all, um, teaching uh, Armenian for, for people in the Arab countries is not that popular. In fact, if you look at our students, because most of them do, do learn Armenian. The percentage of students in, 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 in those countries who go to Armenian schools is far higher than that. Than so so the, first of all, the need. Then, in those countries, if somebody did not go to an Armenian school, if you are from Beirut and you did not go to Armenian school, either you went to a French school or an English school, so you can learn it via English or French. You don't need Arabic. So by, by looking at it, there was not, not a need to, to do all of this in Arabic. Except we, we get some, some requests sometimes. People who, 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 who know Arabic and are not very good in English or French, and they want to learn it. But it's, it's a very small need. It's not uh, prominent at this point. OK, so that's the language. Now, a little bit of numbers. Okay. So today, for individual students, students who are learning by themselves, not the classrooms, we have uh, 2,100 students at this point, who have, uh, since we, we opened uh, the college, in fall of 2009. So within this three to four year period, uh, we have over 2,000 students, which is, uh, <coughs> which is good as a number. It's great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is great. It's, it's, it's a very good as a number. But if you look at the potential, at the total available market, it's not very big. Uh, if you look at the diaspora at large, if you are able to reach everybody, if you are able to motivate everybody, this number could be much higher. And there's no limit. It's bandwidth. Yeah, you yeah, can but increase your bandwidth. You can have more servers. We have mirror servers at various locations to, to help with it. So you can always widen the bandwidth, have more online instructors to be trained, prepared, and, and, and cover more. So we have lots of potential. Okay. Even though this is a huge number, but we can do much more. That's why perhaps I'm here today, to, to make sure that whoever is listening it for the first time knows about it. But not, knowing is not enough. There's so much wealth online, hidden in the internet, that we cannot find it unless we promote it, unless we bring it up. So, so each one of the, us, I think, can, 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 can take this and see who may need it and, and, and present it and take it for them. Uh, because it's hidden. It's not a physical school like this that you see it. It belongs to the community, it belongs to the neighborhood. It doesn't belong to anyone. It sits in the cloud somewhere. So we have to feel the belonging of all of us. Uh, <clears throat> we're expanding. So we're not stopping where we are today. Uh, we are adding new programs, new abilities, because the field changes continuously. The topics, the need change. Uh, so today we are adding, we just announced uh, last week, that we are adding courses in chess. Chess is part of the Armenian culture. Chess is an Armenian culture. For a long time, and Armenians exceed in that, excel in that. Uh, we have seen champions, individual champions, group champions, uh, children champions in chess. And the Armenian government, uh, two years ago, mandated chess to be part of the school curriculum. So every student would go through four years of chess education. Now, the request for chess came from the Armenian government, the, the education ministry. Why? Because by mandating it to all the schools, cities, to villages, to every corner of Armenia, we need teachers. We need the ability to cover that everywhere by, by experts. And sometimes 
having the expert with the full methodology, the ability to teach is not easy. So therefore, optimizing it to multimedia, to online, capturing that course in a nice uh, internet-based mechanism would be great to, to distribute it to every single village all around the country. So today, we are able to, to open this school uh, and to, to, to provide the chess program starting from next month, from October 6th. So we have the first course. So we'll have six levels. So if you look at the chess courses, it'll be fixed at six levels. The first uh, beginner's chess course is starting now, and we are going to, to uh, keep adding it every quarter, one layer. And uh, the first time we're doing it in two languages only, English and Eastern Armenian, to cover the schools and to cover our diaspora here. And soon after, adding the additional languages to come in the production. Again, it's, it's very multimedia, the, the, the games, you play with your teacher, you play with your classmates, but more importantly, you learn the, the Armenian methodology of teaching chess. So we're following the, 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 the chess academy. The chess academy is partner in this. So we're developing the courses jointly. And we have our online instructors being trained on the courses now with special instructors on chess being on them. So this is one new element of our program being augmented, being added. And because it's the first time we're doing it, we're announcing this free of charge to attract more people in the But I mean, you're probably offering but, certificates, right? So that yes. people can take that and go say, say I'm qualified to teach. It, it is very interesting. In fact, recently there was a meeting of the heads of the chess federations around the world, FIDE, uh, that happened in Armenia, in Zagatso, where the president of Armenia, uh, who is also the head of the chess federation, was there to, to, uh, to chair the meeting itself. And the, the, the virtual college, the Armenian virtual college chess program was shown, as you see on the board, to all the heads of the chess federations around the world. And they were very impressed because no such thing exists today. Here we're capturing the whole methodology and, and providing it as a teaching instrument instead of just a game to be played. Teaching strategy, teaching thinking, teaching through that uh, a way of education that has impact on the brain. So it's a nice thing. So we were proud that uh, it was shown at a, at a major international forum dedicated to chess. Uh, we're going beyond that. As you know, uh, when we started, the whole uh, <coughs> system was PC-based, okay. it was computer-based. Uh, but computers are not dominant anymore. For the first time this year, the, the, the computer sales is not going up, but it's going down. Uh, this year, for the first time, the sales of tablets is more than the sales of PCs. Okay. The, the smartphones are already three times more than the PCs. So uh, we had also to, to move to, to mobile equipment. So uh, recently we have uh, developed uh, a nice app uh, for Armenian Virtual College, and that app will be uh, launched very soon, uh, by, by which one will have the mechanism to use mobile equipment to reach uh, our information, our courses, and so on. So it will not be only PC-based, but also app-based mostly on tablets. On phones, it's a little bit more difficult, given the size, to, to, to be able to follow the, the lectures, the communications, and so on. But uh, on tablets, it will, be, uh, it will be good to do that. Okay. So this is, again, one of the extensions that we are building. Another extension we are building is for public that is not able to take courses on a regular basis, right? To, to do a quarter, nine weeks in sequence, four to six hours per week to complete the course. Some of us may be able to do that, some of us may not, but still be interested in what the Armenian Virtual College can offer. So what we decided is to have a program for non-students, learners at large, who can take individual learners, like you're buying a book, you would like to learn from it, but you're not scheduled to take a course, you're not scheduled to take an exam, you're not scheduled to take certain things per week, and synchronize it with other students, but rather download it and learn it by yourself. So, based on the courses, on Armenian music, on Armenian history, on Armenian architecture, on Armenian fine arts, we're building ebooks. 
e-books that are very multimedia in nature. Some of you are familiar perhaps of iBooks that Apple produces, not produces, but delivers, others can produce. Uh, the iTunes is a channel for iBooks. So we are building very nice iBooks and soon you will hear about the launching of this new program where on a regular basis iBooks will be provided and the same thing can be also seen on, on uh, web-based uh, uh, mechanisms. So with, with iBooks what we will do is we will we'll allow you to, on your tablets to have very nice multimedia topics. So each iBook comes on a certain topic and you would, you would learn about that topic on your, at your leisure, the time you want to, the way you want to, without really being hooked to a certain schedule. But those iBooks will be <coughs> motivating enough to, 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 to bring in additional students to join the Army of Virtual College because by seeing those multimedia courses on an individual basis, one will be able to, to get lots of information. So these are meant to be free of charge, uh, downloadable via iTunes or via the web, and on special topics starting from the Armenian highland, the history of our highland, to, to Armenian religious music, to chess for Armenians, and so on and so forth. So a very nice set of topics, uh, including some on tourism, that will make it uh, an, an attractive series that on a periodic basis you will be receiving a message, downloading them, and having a book in hand, in this case an electronic book in hand, on your iPad. You're not charging anything at all for the books? No. It is, it is meant to, 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 to give education for non students. So I covered lots of things. I covered a little bit about our expansion, the new things we're doing, such as the new, new app, the new ebooks, chess program. There are other things that are not announced we're working on, but it's, it's evolving. It's evolving nicely, not in numbers only, but also in, in, in new programs that we're adding. And um, we are open to it. We are open to your ideas, your recommendations, because this is something that belongs to all of us. It's, not, it's very, very inclusive. It's meant for any Armenian or any individual who is interested in Armenian education. More questions? The languages that you teach, is it meant only to make them be able to speak, or do you also teach grammar and the whole, the whole time? It, uh, when at every level, not when you finish, at every level you're learning four things per course. Okay. That is reading, writing, speaking, and comprehension. First level, second level, ninth level. Ninth level you're totally fluent okay. in speaking, in reading, in writing, in understanding. But it goes parallel. It's, it's based on an international standard of teaching uh, second language. It's, uh, it's produced in London and it's a special standard. So we adopted that. We did the Armenian version. The degrees, yes, please. The degrees that we will provide in the future yes. will be approved by the uh, Armenian education. Right. Correct. It is, it is approved by the... Uh, so we do provide... Uh, we do provide our uh, licenses okay, uh, per track. That. But also we do have uh, this master's degree now. It's an MA degree in Armenian education. So the MA degree is also approved by the government. We also have certain arrangements with universities. Uh, in France, for instance, we do have an arrangement with a university called INALCO. INALCO is this Institute of uh, uh, Language and Culture. Uh, so any course you take from Armenian Virtual College, you're automatically recognized as the INALCO course, which is part of the Bologna system. Then you can transfer it to your university in Denmark or in Italy. So the, the, the transfer mechanism is, 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 is nicely established. Yes. Okay. 